Welcome to part two of the master copy of William Adolf Bouguereau's The Prayer. Today we'll prepare the oil painting palette, then paint and selective start the cropped master reference. We're going to be zooming in on a little girl's face. I just love her expression. In my last Bouguereau master copy, I did a monochrome underpainting first. Today, I want to see just how well I can paint a master copy following the selective start method. So let's do this. If you love all things portrait painting, then be sure to subscribe to my channel and hit that notification bell so you're sure not to miss a new video. Welcome to my channel, Shelly J. Cox. Come along with me on my art journey. Okay, we're gonna mix up our palette for the Bouguereau Master Copy Painting. Uh, so what we've got laid out on the palette is Titanium White, Naples Yellow, Yellow Ochre Pale, Vermilion Deep, Transparent Oxide Brown, Cobalt Violet, Sap Green, Cobalt Blue, and we're going to mix that with some white to kind of simulate a King's Blue, and Van Dyke Brown. And I've got a little extra titanium white down here because this is going to be my light area. This is going to be my mid values, and then I'm going to put my darks right here. I like to start mixing in the mid value range. So let's see. Let's go ahead and get some of those khakis and greens done. So let's start with a little yellow ochre pale. Put in a little transparent oxide brown. And I put the transparent oxide brown there next to the vermilion, that red color, because I Think of it as a red. It's just a less saturated red. From there, so since that's sort of a reddish color, it's definitely too red than we want. The complementary color to red is going to be green, so we're going to grab some of the sap green. Just a little touch. And so we're going to need some more. We do want this to be quite a bit green, so let's just load a bit in there. some on the tip of the palette knife. We're going to hold that up. Let's see, that's pretty close to this circle right here. So if we want to get some of these other greens, so these are a little more saturated and this one's a little bit lighter. So from here, grab some of that over and add more green for our more saturated circle there and it's more saturated but not quite this dark so take some of that and lighten it up with some naples yellow naples yellow is one of those colors you don't absolutely have to have on your palette i just like it i think that ought to do it Yes, perfect. So there is a light sort of khaki green. So if we grab a little of this guy and a little of this guy, mix him up. It's a little more neutral than that. So what I'm seeing here is a bit yellow, a bit. So let's add a little titanium white to it because titanium white will knock down some of that saturation and make it a little lighter. So, let's do this. Let's add a little titanium. Well, that's transparent oxide brown. A little transparent oxide brown. That's gonna be a red to neutralize the green. Let's see where we end up. But, happy accident, that looks like one of our circles here. If we just Put a little more white into that. We'll split this guy up and we'll do a pinker version of it and a little more neutral version of it. So to neutralize that, we're going to add a little touch of Van Dyke Brown, which is a very nice neutral color. I kind of use it in place of black. You can see how that just totally neutralized that color there. Good. Could be a scotch. 
layer, touch of that Naples yellow in there to lighten it up. Still stayed nice and neutral. That's looking good. A touch of titanium white in there. We'll neutralize that down just a smidge more. So another cool thing with this glass palette is I have this gray board underneath and it's sort of a neutral uh, five, four value. So if my colors tend to get much lighter or darker than this, then I know they need to go into a different pile section. That's still coming up a bit saturated, I think, so a little more Van Dyke Brown. I really want this to look great down. I mean, look at where we started and look at where we are. <laughs> really tell it's grayed down now. So we were going to make this little pile a bit pinker. So we'll grab a smidge of vermilion deep. Hey, that is pretty darn close. Those are our two pink dots and I think we are coming in right where we need to be. Definitely the right value. We'll leave it there. When we're painting, if we put it down on the canvas and we think it needs to be a little redder, then we'll make it a little redder then. Okay, we need a teal color. So let's grab some Van Dyke Brown. Let's touch of white. Let's get close to the value, which is a tiny bit lighter than that. Not gonna need too much of this. Looks like it's gonna be used in the eye area, so I'm not worried about mixing a whole lot of it. It's amazing when we did the color analysis to see just how dark the whites of the eyes were painted by Bougaro. I love doing that color analysis. It really does open your eyes to the values of the colors that are being used. It's been said that you can paint pretty much anything with the wrong color, but as long as you have the correct value, it's still going to read correctly. So values are pretty important. And that is the right value for the dot I'm looking at, but it is much bluer. So we're going to scooch out half of it to a more bluer. Let's keep that little neutral pal there if we need to use it to neutralize any of our other colors while we're painting. So I'm not mixing every single dot that we analyzed in the painting. I'm just going to mix a few that I know will get me where I need to be. And as we're painting, we'll create some new color piles along the way. A bit more and that's a cobalt blue. Let's lighten it up a bit too. Let's see where we're at with that. And a lighter version. More blue. And a little bit more blue still yet in this darker pile of that same color. There we go. There's our teal. To get a darker khaki color. I think this. We need a little bit darker pile of this. We don't want it to be so dark that it belongs in our dark value pile. Okay, so that looks like a good place to be. Now there's one reddish brown color, which is very close to just the transparent oxide brown mixed with a touch of it's that color um, yellow ochre pale this was our starting color <laughs> but it's much more saturated so let's grab some red that's the vermilion deep mm, redder and lighter 
so it's always a good idea to hold your palette knife up with the paint you're mixing and compare it to the color, whether it be a colored dot or a spot on your subject. Just hold it up close to it and see if the colors are looking right. A little more red, a touch more yellow ochre pale to lighten it up. It was still a bit dark. It seems closer, still a bit dark. Let's grab a little more yellow ochre pale. You don't always have to use white to lighten things. It is good. Mid value piles are done. Let's grab our lights. So we can take a light version of this neutral color. That's why I like starting with the mid values because I can just grab a little bit of those colors to mix my lights with. still in the mid values. That's looking good. Let's get one lighter pile of that. Still yet. Bougaro's skin tones in the light parts are pretty neutral. There's a couple areas that are kind of yellow, but for the most part, those light areas are kind of gray, pinky gray peachy gray, some of that, move over here, and we need to add a little Naples yellow, we want to just warm that up, okay that was a lot, <laughs> let's grab some white, green so we can move some of the pink into that green and it'll neutralize it and probably give us the color we're looking for. That is the color, but it's a little bit dark. Let's make a super light version of that. And so that looks like a good light porcelain skin color. Could even get, believe it or not, a lighter version of that almost white. I'm not even grabbing any of the pile, I'm just using what was left on the palette knife. That'll work. So we can take some of that, move it here, and we're making a sort of a gray mauve color. So we'll grab some of our Van Dyke Brown. some of this cobalt violet and mix it in with this pink pile here just to knock down some of that pink because we needed it to be less warm. There we go. So these two colors are similar. Looks like we need a little lighter green color. some transparent oxide brown. Could be a little lighter, so let's scooch some of that pile in there. <laughs> it's looking pretty good. And let's just make a little bluer version of that. And 
And we need a violet, violet color. Let's grab some of these guys. It's more of a blue violet, so we're gonna put some cobalt blue in there with it. It's fairly saturated. This is gonna be a color we use in the white of the eye. A bit purple and a little bit dark, so we add a little bit of this Naples yellow, that should neutralize it and lighten it at the same time. One thing's for sure, Big Girl did not paint this little girl's face with very much saturated color. So if we mix anything up and it looks really saturated on our palette, that is not going to work in our painting. be a scotch bluer so I'll add a little cobalt back in touch more there we go so we need a steely darker blue version of this so let's grab some of that gray out of our mid value mix it in there and pop in some cobalt there we go Still in our light value, don't want it to be too dark. I'm gonna add just a touch more cobalt blue. There we go. I'm gonna put a touch more blue in our lighter pile. I didn't want it to be too light and not blue enough. I think we're ready to do the darks. So we have quite a few dark dots in our dark value section. I'm going to group that into about four piles. So we'll start with this very red pile. Almost equal values of transparent oxide brown with the vermilion deep. saturated because when we analyze them we see how saturated they actually are. Let's pull out some more transparent oxide brown. Mix that with almost equal parts of Van Dyke brown and we'll get a nice neutral brown color. So our darkest darks, I'm just going to use straight Van Dyke brown. This will be one step down from that. There's a sort of a neutral brown color, so let's just grab transparent oxide brown again. Throw in some of this green, since that transparent oxide brown is a red, really, it lives in the red family. The green will neutralize it without making it too much darker. More green. mixture of the Van Dyke and the transparent oxide brown and put that in the low lights, grab some Van Dyke brown and that ought to do it. We are ready to paint. The palette is mixed. We've got all our lights, our mid values, and our dark values. All right, let's start painting. If you remember in the last video, we selected the left corner of the left eye to begin our selective start. So with selective start, you lay down that first brush stroke. Then the following brush stroke touches that first one. And then each successive brush stroke after that is always touching the last brush stroke that you've laid down. So here's an excerpt from Richard Schmidt's Alla Prima 2 about selective start. 
or the Big Bang Method, as he likes to say. A number of years ago, Richard Schmidt asked himself why it was always necessary to paint something almost right or almost complete, and then correct or complete it, meaning a block in. He wondered why he had to wait for a block in to happen before he could cut loose and have fun with the subsequent stages of a painting and explore all the elements in the subject at once. Why couldn't the first series of a painting be the correct and complete in drawing, edges, value, and color, and be what he wanted to see on his canvas? Why couldn't the next strokes also be like that, and all the rest, and so on? His answer was, there's no reason at all. If I can see the colors and the shape of a subject well enough to correct them, then it made sense I could also get them right the first time and thus eliminate the almost right stage. All I had to do was be very exact about how I looked at my subject and then equally fastidious and patient about what went into my canvas. And, oh yes, perhaps most importantly, you must have a very clear image in your mind, a sort of conceptual block-in to guide each step. If you want to dive deep into the selective start method, I highly recommend Richard Schmidt's book, A La Prima 2. I'll list the information in the description. You can find it on Amazon. Now, as much as I love creating my painting palette and diving into a selective start method, if my subject matter is more complicated or it's a very large painting, I most often will do a underpainting of some kind. If you have any questions at all about the selective start method, I'll do my best to answer them. Just put your questions in the comments. Also, I'd love any feedback you have regarding the videos that I'm playing on my channel. Maybe you have um, a recommendation or there's a video topic that I haven't covered you'd like to see me cover. Please just put that information in the comments below as well. So with the selective start method, you want to look at your subject almost as if it was made up of little mosaic tiles of color and light. And each one of those shapes has a specific color and value and temperature and you want to select the correct brush that's going to give you that shape as easily or quickly. You want to put down as few brush strokes as possible to build the structure you're working on at that time. So here's another uh, excerpt from Richard Smith's book, A La Prima 2. He says he tries to paint each little shape on his subject as carefully as he can from the start. He says he does it in as finished a way as possible. He uses each correct color shape to guide him in the painting of all adjoining shapes. He builds his picture in this way, like laying bricks from a single accurate point, painting outward from that center until he has the painting he wanted before him. Afterwards, it's just a matter of pulling the whole thing together, mopping up, so to speak, softening edges here and there, scrutinizing it for drawing errors, most often mistakes in alignment, eliminating unnecessary value changes, and checking the overall design for simplicity. And then he's done. You'll see every now and then that I'll check the um, proportions and layout of my face with my proportion tool. So when I'm doing that, I have my reference pulled up on my computer monitor screen, and it's zoomed in to be the exact same size as what I am painting on my canvas, so I can use my proportion tool on a one-to-one. -one. So I hope you'll bear with me. I'm having a little trouble getting my video camera to capture the colors that I'm laying down on my canvas accurately. The colors seem to be a little cooler. They're a little bit off from what I actually am painting with. I like doing the master copies, especially with um, William Adolf Bouguereau. It's uh, a great way to learn how to capture the type of skin tones that the old masters were painting. And what I've learned after doing a couple of these master copies is that their skin tones are very neutral. A lot of gray and beige colors, some greens, uh, there's just har hardly if it, any at all uh, saturated color being used. 
And what I'm noticing in his reference is the shadows are definitely warm and even the transition areas where it's sort of a green gray color, um, those are even warm. So the light colors are quite neutral, if not a little bit cool. So as soon as I start transitioning over into those mid-tone values, I want to make sure the paint I'm using is a warm version of that neutral color. So in this painting of Selective Start Method, I started with the left eye and then we moved across over the bridge of the nose into the right eye and then I went up into the forehead. So this was just my choice with this painting. It's what I felt like doing. There's no right or wrong. There's no rhyme or reason. Uh, you can go in any direction you want. Sometimes I'll do a complete half of one face and then move across to the other side. Sometimes I do an eye and go down into the nose, over into the mouth, and then come back up the other side of the face. It's just whatever you feel like in the moment. So since you're painting uh, shapes of color, you're not really painting things. You're not painting a face really. You're painting just little puzzle pieces. So some artists actually turn their reference upside down and then turn their canvas upside down and they paint it that way so that it forces the brain to just see the shapes of color and light and forget that you're painting a thing at all. I think it's important with Selective Start to really just take your time. When you lay down a brush stroke, if it's not the right size or it's the wrong color or value or put it slightly in the wrong place, then correct it right then. You don't want to go on from there until it's correct because each successive brush stroke that you're going to lay down is going to be based on the correctness of the previous brush strokes. So a lot of times I don't mind starting on a white canvas, but if you want to, you can um, lay down some color, just rough it up a little bit um, so that you're not painting on a solid white canvas. I know that can be daunting for some. And even when you're laying down the mid-tone to shadow colors on that white canvas, it can throw you off a little bit sometimes if you're not used to it. It may look like they're really very dark when actually they're not, especially once you get a darker background laid in, you'll see how that all of a sudden they'll look a lot lighter than you thought they were. There we go, another little check of proportions. I'm going to keep checking this nose because I know myself here. When I'm painting children's faces, I seem to always paint the nose too long. So I know to check that that doesn't happen here. Something's just bothering me with this nose, so I'm just going to paint over what I had and start again. There's no rules, you just do it till it feels or looks right to you. And there you go, the nose was too long. Even though I knew I was gonna do it, I still did it. I tried to not do it, but it happened. <laughs> I think part of it is the position of her head. She's tilted her chin up and her head's tilting back a little bit, so the nose is gonna be foreshortened. So not only is it already an issue because it's a child's face, it's a foreshortened child's nose.
remember to paint your transitions with actual different colors. Don't just blend one color into another. That's not going to give you a, um, a look that's got some life to it. And no hard edges with the mouth, especially with children's mouths. You want those, uh, the outline areas of those lips to be really soft edges. So as we're moving into the neck and shoulder area, we are getting further away from our light source. And even though we're still in the lights, the colors are gonna be a little bit darker and a little bit more neutral. As I mentioned before, you can see here as we're laying down our darker areas, it's making the skin tones and the lights look really very, very light. And even the shadow side and the shadow areas are looking lighter than they did initially. Now, of course, this is an optical illusion, but if you need to go back in and darken anything up, uh, now would be a good time to do it. So something that I've learned from this master copy is I think what I do is if, if I have such a dark reference like this one and I don't want to do an underpainting, I will probably go ahead and just cover the canvas with a mid-tone to a little bit dark mid-tone, like a value six, uh, all over the whole canvas so as I'm painting my lights won't be so light or look so light once I get the darks down. I'll have a little bit better reference from the start. So if your skin tones are not coming out the way you want, they're still looking more saturated, kind of Barbie doll-like, 
uh, go ahead and take a picture of your color painting palette and compare it to the palette analysis, painting analysis that we've done in the past of some of the master portraits here, or maybe find a master portrait of some skin tones that you admire and do an analysis of your own and then compare that to your own painting palette and you'll see just exactly where you need to make changes in order for your painting to have the look of the paintings that you love and admire. And if you need to learn more about how to do color analysis using Photoshop, you can go back and watch the video part one of this master copy. And further down in my video library, there's a couple other um, how to's on creating your palette analysis from Photoshop. So as I'm painting in the hair, I do not want to try to paint in every strand of hair. I just want to get blocks of light, shapes of light. Um, looking at the hair in three different values, I'm seeing the darkest parts of the hair, the mid values, and then the highlights, and that's what I'm painting. taking the big brush and going over the face that's just knocking down some of the brush strokes that may be a bit too um, high up with a bit more of an impasto look than I want I'm not doing any blending that um, brush is just barely whispering or just slightly kissing across the surface of the canvas so when you're doing a selective start method you want each brush stroke to stand on its own you don't want to kill them or blend them away so much that you can't really tell where the brush stroke was laid down and let the edges be kind of feathery um, comber brushes do a great job of blending and feathering into the last brush stroke that was laid down so they're not blended together they're just laid one on top of the other but with the comber brushes they just kind of feather together and they leave beautiful edges so be the master of your painting and put those brush strokes down with bravura if you've never seen a comber brush uh, the edges of the brush the tip of the brush looks like a comb they're spread apart there's spaces in between the brush hairs apologize again just the coloring that my paintings looking from my video camera is way off from what I've actually painted here you'll see in the final picture how the colors are um, coming out the uh, last picture in the video Now that I've got everything in place, all the features are down, all the values are in place, I'm going to go through and put the final touches on. Uh, as Richard Schmidt said in his book, a la prima two, it's kind of the mopping up stage.
at this point we're just going over fine details it's just tiny tiny additions or touches just moving something the very slight little whisper of a move or a brush stroke can make all the difference in the finishing touches So this painting took about four to five hours to complete. I could, I did it all in one day, but it did take quite a few breaks. Um, so as I'm painting, I am working wet into wet the entire time. Also, you're seeing every brush stroke that I've laid down. This isn't a time-lapse video, it's just a sped up video. So once you've completed a master copy, you want to sign it on the back and you put on the front or the back, depending on what you like, um, it's going to say after, and then you'll put the name of the artist. In this case, it'll say after William Adolph Bugaro, and then I put master copy painted by me, Cox. And here you can see my palette towards the end of the painting. And here you have my master copy of William Adolph Bugaro's The Prayer. Thanks for watching and be sure to subscribe.